and welcome to the Choral Conductors Colloquium, Volume 2, Lecture 3. My name is Raul Dominguez, and I will be your host and moderator. Before we begin, please note this webinar is being recorded and will be posted in the near future on our YouTube channel. There you can find all of our past lectures. The University of Colorado Boulder is offering credit and certificates through their Department of Continuing Education for those who attend all five lectures. Details on how to apply can be found in your colloquium eblast. Today's lecture will be a little over an hour long, followed by a 15 minute question and answer session. Please submit all of your questions at any time during the lecture using the Q&A button found in your toolbar. Priority will be given to questions about today's topic. Please do not submit questions to the chat room. Thank you to our sponsors, you, our viewers, as well as Dr. Gregory Gentry and the Choral Department at the University of Colorado Boulder. To help keep our resources free and available, please consider a small $10 donation uh, to the colloquium. The donation link can now be found in the chat. Now, it is my sincere privilege to welcome Professor Emeritus from, the, from Florida State University, visiting professor uh, at Yale University, and our national ACDA president, Dr. Andre J. Thomas. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here. All right. Well, most of you probably know by now, I wrote this book called Way Over in Beulah Land, and we're going to talk about it today. And we're going to talk about um, the development of a form that's very special to me, uh, that of the Negro spiritual. But it's yet on the far side. Seems to me they get close. Sure seems Plus it's like dead now. Sure like and this part is mighty cold. Listen him. Ain't a soul going back. That's how I kiss you for this. I kiss you right here in this young room. Every soul that done started this young journey is gonna make it to freedom. But the first and every soul that look back to slavery gonna die right here in this young river. For I see to it. As we're clear. Then lay low and keep your heads both water, children. Just wait. Now stay close together 
so you can keep warm. Now don't you worry about that damn mice and them dogs. Cause God's gonna trouble this young water. Just trust God. And trust old Moses and him. And wait, children. Cause we's on our way to freedom. What you've been listening to is a reenactment. And you heard a female voice say, not a soul going back or I'll kill you for it. That's the voice of Harriet Tubman. She had to be tough because one runaway slave could get all of them killed. So what, how did this all begin? It's 1619 and a Dutch man of war has just landed on the coast of Virginia and brought to this country the first of the African slaves. They say that the slave ship must have been like the Tower of Babel. Um, you saw in the reenactment a, a slave ship that was just um, um, uh, showing the, the schematic of looking down on the slave ship. But the slaves came uh, from all over the what we call the Gold Coast, uh, from the West Coast. Um, they were different peoples. They were the Akan, the Fan, the Yuba, the Igbo, the Fanti, the Fulani, the Ashanti, and so many, many more. And for them, you can't imagine what that must have felt like to be taken from your homeland and then led to this new, unusual land. I didn't know how that actually felt until uh, I went to Ghana to do the African Choral Festival there. And the choirs came in from Benin all the way up to Senegal, all throughout the Gold Coast, and they all came. We had about 500 singers or so. And we went to a place that they called the castle. And um, I got to the castle and um, I looked up and I saw this beautiful white edifice. And then as my foot hit the sand, the choir from Benin started singing in perfect English, oh, freedom, oh, freedom. And I, it then hit me where I really was. And then I entered into the gate and I looked around and there was a room that said for men, there was a room for women, there was a room for children where the slaves were held. And then there's in the corner, there's a, a, a gateway leading downward made out of just stones and steps for stones going down. And as I stepped, and it, at the sign said, point of no return. And as I stepped down, my foot finally hit the sands and my eyes saw the Atlantic Ocean. And I thought, that's the sight that my ancestors saw. And remembering that for many of them, they had not been on ships. So what was the journey like? Oh, it was awful. They were kept below deck. Um, slop thrown down for food. Um, they couldn't even talk to each other. Um, many of them were in different languages. And, and so disease, um, they would bring them on board. Some jumped over and committed suicide. But if the slave ship arrived with 25% of its cargo, it was considered successful. So out of this heart-rending story, where does this, how does this music come about being? Well, there were two things that were very important. We had to figure out how to keep people enslaved. And so how do you do, a, do that? Well, we thought maybe the best way might be to give them religion. Religion might make them a little bit more docile. So itinerant preachers went throughout the South preaching to the slaves. Now, the interesting thing is they weren't terribly bright because they began with the Old Testament. And you can imagine starting with the Old Testament and talking about the story of Moses, who becomes our hero, of course, Moses. And we don't know who it was, but some slaves started singing, go down, Moses. You know, and then they talked about all other Old Testament characters. There was Joshua who um, led his people around the, the walls of Cain and the walls came down into the promised land. So Joshua was a, a favorite of ours. And some sisters said Joshua did the battle of Jericho and that song was born. Um, 
then Daniel, you know, did my Lord deliver Daniel? Why not every man? And for me, I love David. Uh, uh, David was a special character to me. Why was he so special to me? Well, number one, he was a musician and he played on his harp. He eased Saul's temperament. And, but more than that, uh, and I, I, he loved music. Um, then the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. And I thought, ooh, all the things David has done, then I have a chance. It also says David danced before the Lord. Some say dance naked before the Lord. I don't do that. But other than that, I love David. And somebody like me said, little David, play on your harp. Hallelujah. And that song is born. And so those are many of the Old Testament songs. Why am I mentioning this to you? Because if you're going to interpret this music, you must know what that scriptural reference is. Now, there are the New Testament ones. Now, they like to preach to us a lot uh, about uh, Paul and Paul's message of uh, slaves, be obedient to your masters. So my ancestors said, yeah, we hear that. Uh, but Saul, Paul, you don't get your own song. You get mentioned, Paul and Silas were in jail, you know, or, or we recognize that he was a great preacher, you know, in one of the songs, if you cannot sing like an angel, if you cannot preach like Paul, that's the only acknowledgement he gets. And so we were listening and internalizing all of this, you know, and then we got to the New Testament. And of course, the person who was the most influential for us was Jesus. And so we love Jesus. So there's two kinds of spirituals. So keep these categories straight, Old Testament, New Testament, and then personal expression. Now, what do I mean by personal expression? Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. I looked over Jordan, and what did I see? A band of angels coming after me. That was personal expression. And so we have a number of those. And look at that, because that's going to later on lead us to um, another form of music. Now, what were some of these meanings? Let's take a look of an arrangement that I did years ago in 1970, I guess it was published in 1980. Um, the piece is called Keep Your Lamps. The text goes, keep your lamps trimmed and burning, keep your lamps trimmed and burning, keep your lamps trimmed and burning, the time is drawing nigh. So what does it mean? Well, the scriptural reference, and you have to know this, is based in, in the gospel. It talks about the wise and the foolish virgins. And they were told to get their lamps, set them, get them trimmed and set them burning and meet the bridegroom at the appointed place. Well, there were some wise ones and there were some foolish ones. Well, they got to the appointed place and the bridegroom didn't show up. And so the poor foolish had to go back to the village for more oil for their lamp, their lamps. Can, the Bible doesn't tell us why they couldn't share the, the, the same space. But while they were gone, Jesus said, you know not the day nor the hour when the Son of Man will return. Be ye ready. So how does this song come from that? Well, it's a warning that perhaps Harriet Tubman, Big Lake Joe, or any other conductor on the Underground Railroad might be coming through. For instance, I'm working in the field and Raul is my buddy, my best buddy, and he's also a slave. So we're out there in the field. Now we had to get a hand, make a sound, but we can't talk, right? Uh, and so um, I wanna let Raul know that there's a possibility of escape. I could simply go, keep your lamps. And he goes, mmm, trimmed and burning. And somebody else goes, keep your lamps <coughs> trimmed and burning. And before long, there is a billow of sound. And then by a daybreak, Raul is gone 
and he's on his way to freedom. So that's the sociological meaning and the spiritual meaning, and both are important to share when performing this music. Now, dialect. This is one of the things that causes the biggest problems for people. And it caused a huge problem for me. Now, for me, I didn't like this music very much. You got to remember, I grew up in, the, in, in Kansas, born in the 50s and so in the 60s. We were still somewhat, uh, we, the schools were, uh, we hadn't busing or anything, and we still were somewhat segregated. So um, I hated this music, you know. Sooner we'll be done with the troubles at the wheel, the troubles at the wheel, the troubles at the wheel. I just didn't like this music at all. And so um, the reason I didn't like it, because it felt like, you know, it was minstrel sounding. It sounded like something created by white people to make fun of black people. Well, as it would have to be, um, my first year of college, there was a guest who came. As a little tiny little black man, and he was in rehearsing us, and 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 I won't go through how many times I integrated a school, but there were only just two or three of us in this choir of African descent, and he was a master teacher, and he noticed, and a master teacher looks and looks for facial indications that people are grasping or are engaged, and he was masterful. So in the break, he said, uh, young man, can you, let's go for a little walk. And he said to me, um, you, son, you seem to not like this music. I said, no, sir, I hate this music. And he said, well, why do you hate this music? And I went, sooner we'll be dealing with the trouble to do word. And he laughed and he said, that's not even my piece, that's Dawson's piece. And being a cocky kid, I said, well, I guess yours is not much better. And he just looked at me, he says, let me educate your son. He said, what's bothering you is the way it sounds. And I said, yes. And so he went through and gave me many of these indications that James Weldon Johnson put in the foreword to his uh, three volumes of spirituals. The TH sound, that was cumbersome for me. And what, what Jester Harrison told me, he said that that TH is not in the of the tribal languages of Africans. And I thought, okay, he said, and so all your ancestors did was accommodate. And I thought, okay, that makes sense. Now, what does that mean for you as the, the conductor and you see that TH sound? TH is an article. It is not a subject, it's not a verb, it's not an adjective, it's not even an adverb, it's way down the list don't emphasize that word so that it becomes more natural um, in the articulation. Sooner we'll be done with the troubles of the world, the troubles of the world, sooner we'll be done with the troubles of the world. That sounds completely different. Okay, so the suppressing of the R, okay? Um, and it becomes a schwa. Now, better becomes better. Um, never becomes never. Door, door. Mourner, mourner. And, and these are all sounds and you think, ooh, they couldn't say that er. Well, yeah, they could. But then I was tickled because I was taking a course called English Diction for Singers. And it was using the book of Madeline Marshall. And it says about the R, when E or vowel precedes the R, in good singing, the R is turned into a schwa. So, and I thought, you know, my ancestors knew 200 years ago that you don't sing those R's. Now, the final one, the phonetic decay. Phonetic decay is when you drop off the end of a word. Morning becomes morning. Um, Giving becomes given. Um, so it's groaning becomes groaning. Burning becomes burning. All right. So I thought, well, what does that mean? 
I often talk about my son, who I'm very proud of, uh, who is a, a structural engineer. He was trained as an architectural engineer and certified as a uh, civil and is a structural engineer. And I'm always very, he's always a very bright kid. But every morning that I got up when he was a teenager, I experienced phonetic decay. I'd say, good morning, son. And he would say, good morning. I said, how are you doing today, son? I'm doing fine, dad. How are you? Okay, I'm going, hmm. And it's a choice of how the language sounds and that becomes uh, what we do. Now, if we take something like keep your lamps, well, even before we take it, make sure that you don't overdo it because when you overdo it, you make that the focus of the music and not the music itself. Um, for instance, in keep your lamps, trimmed and burning, keep your lamps. That gives you sort of an idea. Too much. Um, if, uh, if I am grilling a steak and I am preparing it for, let's say I'm preparing it for Lynn Gackle. I don't know if she's on here or not, but I'm preparing this for Lynn Gackle. And, and I know she likes, she's really finicky about her steak. So I marinate it all you know, night long and I put it on the grill and I add salt and pepper. She has a steak. Now, let's say Hillary Applestock, I know that she's not so particular about her steak. So I just put salt and pepper on it. Okay, boom. So what do we have and why that analogy? They both have steaks, okay? With or without the dialect, you have the spiritual. You both have, they both have steaks. Now, it's just the amount of seasoning that you want to put onto that, that sound. Okay, let's move on. Now, how do you know how to do some of these things? Um, there are two books that I'm gonna to recommend to you. I'd already talked to you about uh, my book. Um, and I would recommend to you in their own words, Slave Life and the Power of the Spiritual, Eileen Gunter. And if you want, it's, it's a wonderful book. Uh, it has so many passages from uh, people who were interviewed as slaves and that, and thus the title, in their own words. Another one I would recommend to you is a new perspective, um, and I can't read the top of it, of, of American spiritual history, context and linguistics as we, I'm sorry I messed that title up, but I can't move the document. Okay, a new perspective for use of dialect in African American spiritual history, context and dialect. This is Dr. Felissa Robert Westville State. This is a, a great study. Um, and, and what she does is she looks at all of the Southern languages, you know, and, and, and she looks at the dialects. And then there's a, a wonderful chapter on uh, African American dialect as it develops. Um, there is a, a good look at um, early transcriptions. Um, she's looking at this through a, um, um, through a um, how can I say this? a linguistic lens. And so um, it's a great book and I think you would find it very, very, very helpful. Now, why, I, I'm gonna go back to the, the text. Why the text is so important is two reasons. Anytime you do a music of a culture, you must first understand the culture. And then after you understand the culture, then you, then you begin to understand the music and the language and how that music feels and how that music functions. The problem often is that you don't want to be there where there's a little kid sitting in the group going, oh, I hate this music. This is not my music. You don't want to be that person because you, know, you don't understand where it comes from. You have to be able to explain everything to them, which means you have to do the research you have to do to do a good performance. Now, tone quality. Uh, 
no writers have, uh, historians have told us that the sound was like billows coming from the field. Uh, you can imagine the, the slaves in row working and keeping time and singing all of his music. Well, even though it does sound like billows from the fields, don't get that confused with the, um, um, that it being just simply loud. Here are some of your arrangers. Now you have to look at these arrangers and see what they were attempting to do. Okay, you see a number of the Monday Moore, Eugene Simpson, William Melton, Mitchell South Hall, um, uh, Harry T. Burley, who was the first to to uh, arrange the spiritual for solo voice, Paul Johnson, Wendell Whalem, who for years was at Moore House. Paul Johnson, first professional choir. I want to pay you a little bit of this clip. This is from Green Pastures. There's plenty to eat for the children played. The grown-ups passed the time of day, except in the course, the choir. God give them songs to sing. So they sang to the Lord the songs he liked to hear. And this is what Hall's choir sounded like. They had done Green Pastures on Broadway and moved out to Hollywood to make this happen. Many of the other arrangers, you'll recognize those names. And of course, William Dawson, Betty Jackson, uh, Lena McLean, uh, William Henry Smith, Robert de Cormier, Ralph Hunter, and of course, Alice Parker and Robert Shaw, Marvin Curtis. And of course, there is William Dawson over here. Uh, Mr. Dawson was indeed a mentor. I remember when he, when he heard Keep Your Lamps, which was my first published uh, arrangement, he said, son, your music's all right, but it just don't have enough counterpoint in it. And I said, well, Mr. Dawson, do you think the slaves were in the field singing in fugue? He said, don't matter. And so later on, I had another arrangement with piano. He said, you got that piano. And then it was the Southern Division of ACDA. And when Winston Salem, when I'm introducing the whole uh, uh, convention use, uh, my setting of rock in Jerusalem, and it is an homage to both Jester and to Mr. Dawson. And so I started it, you know, and as Jester's Elijah Rock begins, Elijah Rock, shout, shout, Elijah Rock. Rock in Jerusalem begins, I hear rocking in the land, rocking in the land. And so that was an homage and then the women come in. And so that's really clear. So I'm conducting a lawn and I look down and there is Mr. Dawson sitting in that seat and going, oh no. And he has this frown on his face, you know. And uh, I keep going. And then I get to the last three pages that are really an homage to him. Little Stretto and him, rocking in the land, the land, rocking in the land, all of that, which often goes out of tune. And when I looked up, I don't know if you can see my face or not. When I looked up, he'd gone from this. To... Then he came up on stage and he said, son, come here. I want to hug that neck of yours. I said, OK, sir. He said, son, I said, yes, sir. He said, you know something? I said, what, sir? He says, that's a little better. So that was Dawson. This was Tuskegee. Easy go, saw the wheel, way up in the middle of the air. Easy go, saw the wheel, way in the middle of the air. Easy go, saw the wheel, way up in the middle of the air. Easy go, saw the wheel, way in the middle of the air. Tuskegee. And they went all over the world. And now we have lots of young writers, as you can see, coming along in various companies. 
And then, of course, there's Moses Hogan, who I attribute uh, really did most in our generation to reinvigorate the spiritual. This is what he said. Um, well, you know, and I had a, a background in the African-American Black Baptist Church. And in our musical offering, um, many of the spirituals that I selected were part uh, probably of our religious worship experience during that time. And uh, I remembered many of these arrangements growing up as a child. My uncle was the choir director there, and I would always um, wait for the a cappella spirituals. In addition, of course, there was a wide variety of musical offering, you know, your hymns, your anthems, and your gospel songs. But I was definitely interested in the spirituals. And so um, later on, I guess, when uh, there was an interest in my arrangements. I simply decided to pin those arrangements and maybe add a new harmony or a new setting of many of the spirituals that I grew up with as a child. And we have often, we have all heard his 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 arrangements and the Moses Hogan singers. Brazil Denard and Robert Morse here, also unusual writings. Um, some more gospel or jazz influence. Um, I used to call them the babies, but they're no longer babies. Uh, uh, with uh, Rollo Dilworth and Rosephany Powell. Um, Brandon Boyd's coming along here. Uh, Larry Farrell, you'll hear jazz influences, nice 11th, 13th. And often you can find a recording. And so I would suggest that perhaps you listen to some of those recordings. Whatever you do, and I'm going to get out of here for just a moment. Um, whatever you do, be careful of the performance practice and give the culture the respect that it is due. I don't know how we're doing on time. Um, Raul? Dr. Thomas, you're doing great. We are 35 minutes in. Okay, so I have a little bit more time, okay? Um, I think I'm gonna open it up for questions now. And I think that will, that will help us even, uh, even more. Great. One moment, please. All right. <clears throat> Thanks everyone for tuning in so far. Our first question, uh, Dr. Thomas, this is a, a brief one. Would you say that any of that good news is um, uh, personal expression? Mm -hmm. What does he say? I got a home up in that kingdom. Ain't that good news? No. That would be going to lay down my and shoulder up my cross, going to take it home to my Jesus. Ain't that good news? Yeah, I'd say very much so. Great. Yeah. I can just remind everyone to keep all questions going into the chat room. Another attendee asks your thoughts on non-black composers arranging spirituals. I know there's 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 a lot, you know, and of course you saw I I, I put uh, Robert Shaw and Alice Parker and you saw and, and Alice of course is in the book. Uh, I think if you do your homework, you can do a good arrangement. There are things that are idiomatic uh, to the black ear that make, uh, you know, that um, lend itself you know, to the black experience. But I, I think you can. But w the mistake is we sometimes do things that are kind of crazy. You know, like we, we set a piece of music uh, in Spanish, and we don't speak Spanish, and it's off and it's going some places. People look at it and think there are three syllables that are supposed to be there, not just a diphthong. What's going on here? Um, that's the same way I feel about spiritual arrangements. You know, they need to be made with dignity and understanding of the gravity of them. For instance. You know, um, dancing is spiritual, okay? 
and I hope you can see my hands. Mm -hmm. Open the saints, ch ch go marching in, ch ch jazz square, the saints go marching in. Woo, woo, I know. Okay, no, no. Um, there's some elements that belong in, in, in even in, in movement, there are some elements that belong in the gospel area that aren't in the spiritual area. And you've got to be aware of what the composer's intent was. Now, let's talk about how these things were created. Now, I talked about the preachers coming in to preach, but not only did they preach, they also brought their hymnody. It was Southern hymnody, okay? And so that's why you see those early arrangements like from Richard Allen, okay? Uh, Richard Allen had in, in his first hymnal uh, at Mother Bethel uh, had um, the spiritual arrangement. It looked kind of like a hymn, basically. And that was what was in our ear as we began to listen to it, okay? And so uh, when we're talking about an American form, yes, indeed, it is an American form because it, it enhances all of that. Um, it's a gentle balance of walking that uh, tightrope uh, because some black composers, I have students who have done a lot, well, one particular student on uh, non-indigenous music, um, you know, when you look at, let's say, William, uh, you look at uh, Nathaniel Dett, the Ordering of Moses or something like that, the spiritual is quoted, you know, it is, it is there. And, and it's not meant to be, how can I say it? Um, a concert spiritual that's just meant to be the reference of it as into a bigger kind of piece. I think that's what we have to be careful if we're writing the arrangements, the concert arrangements to make sure that we don't take it into another direction that it no longer has its, its, um, its soul, basically. Hmm. Thank you. Our next question comes from Lisa who asks about the differences in tone quality between spiritual and gospel? Well, you know, um, <laughs> there is more individuality in their own, own uh, in individual voices. This is what I mean. Uh, I've got two black singers. Uh, one's name is Kathleen Battle. And the other one's name is Jesse Norman or Leontine Price. They're both sopranos. They come in different versions um, um, with, um, with popular singers. Um, you contrast Aretha Franklin with Dionne Warwick, you know, two kinds of tonal expressions. Um, I don't really aim for specific tone quality. Um, um, I think when we think about it and we say we want to do it authentically, most of the time we're thinking about what if uh, we're thinking about the sound of the historically black colleges. Okay. And you've got to remember that at those historically black co colleges, they were wonderful singers there and they were taught to sing in the Western art tradition. Okay. Lots of Arado lifted soft palettes and, uh, you know, and that's what you got in, in the early HBCUs. That was that sort of big, rich, operatic-like sound, okay? And I certainly think about that if, if I'm doing, um, you know, even if I'm doing Dawson at times, Tuskegee is still sort of in my ear of it being a little warmer, okay? But, you know, I would say um, I would probably switch it in the middle depending upon the affect of the piece of music. So I know I didn't give a, a, a real clear answer about tone quality. I think it needs to be honest. Mm. You remember when I said about it being a spiritual no matter what? It is. Now, what takes it out of feeling like a spiritual when you start creating sounds like country music 
my brothers done left me in you today. And you see, if you sing a spiritual like that, then you're gonna get a country song. Okay, not appropriate. Okay. But it doesn't mean that all of a sudden um, you gotta be Mary J. Blige on every other measure because she's a black singer. So aim for honesty. I, I aim for a little bit more depth, you know, more parental depth and space, especially to create more color, color choices. And then I play with the color palette. Great, thank you. Our next question from Loida asks, I know that, or it says, I know there might be many ways to teach a spiritual, what mm -hmm. would be some approaches to teach the culture to predominantly white or non-African American students? Do you start with a conversation, a reading, or do you teach the rhythm? I think if I'm starting for the first time with an ensemble, I think I tell them the story. I mean, these are all reflections upon hearing a story. And I think I would start with what the story means and put it all together. Um, I had, a, a, it was my first year of teaching at the University of Texas at Austin, a second year, I think. And there was a big festival that was going on. There were three adjudicators and I was one of them. And the choir came in from the valley and you have to know the valley, but it's, this is Eagle Pass High School and they were all Hispanic, all Hispanic. And so they got on the stage and they announced their music and, said, and we will do blah, 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 blah. And we will close with, keep your lamps. So we were sitting there and the director didn't know for sure um, who, the, who the actual judges were. And one judge had to go on stage and the announcer said, ladies and gentlemen from Eco Pass High School, you're, well, let me get to their performance of Keep Your Lamps. They did a beautiful job. Then when they got to Keep Your Lamps, it was enlightening in many ways because it sounded like this, keep your lumps trimmed and burning, keep your lumps trimmed and burning, keep your lumps trimmed and burning. The time is drawing, I keep your lumps trimmed and burning. And I thought, whoa. So anyway, and I could tell Naomi was going through her Chicano period. She was dressed in all leather. And so uh, they said, ladies and gentlemen from Eagle Pass High School, your clinician today is Dr. Andre Thomas. And Naomi went, oh, she. <laughs> and I went on the stage and I looked at those beautiful young people and I said to them, I said, I really enjoyed your performances, you know? And I enjoyed your performance of my piece too. And they all smiled. And I said, I've never heard it sung like that before. And it had so much energy and vitality in, in it. And they said, yay. And I said, um, would you like to hear what I was thinking about when I was sitting and arranging it? And they said, yes. And so then I had them do something. I had them to all turn and face one wall. And they put their hands on the shoulders of the person in front of them. And then I said, your arms and a, your arms represent chain that is connecting your right foot to the right foot of the person in front of you. Around your ankle is a shackle. Okay? And we're going to start to keep your lamps again. And I want you to move in one direction. And how would you move if that occurred? And they said, well, we couldn't lift our leg. I said, no, you had to just do it. And they went, keep your lamps and all of a sudden you know it was like you know the whole audience went oh, you know and then i was walking to my car and this young lady ran and said sir sir i said yes she said uh, i said what is it sweetheart she says i want to talk to you about that song i said what song that song i said <laughs> was the song you did with the high school from from uh from eagle bass i said yes what about that song and she said, it made me, I said, it made you what? It made me, I said, what, sweetheart? She said, it made me feel so, I said, what? And she said, black. And I said, it makes me feel black too. And then I looked up in the sky and I said, thank you, Mr. Harrison. It's now gone full circle. So I hope that kind of lets you sort of understand what I feel about um, teaching it. 
because you have to understand it from the inside and out and not just the outside, okay? And people do all kinds of, you know, uh, people will study the music of Lully and Charpentier and, and say, oh, they will say, oh, those, those straight eighth notes, oh, we probably should use Enegal. Oh, yeah. Those same some people who read about Enegal and what it means to change those eighth notes and, and to a triplet-like figure, they spent time learning that. But understanding how to perform this, they said, oh, it's just fun. And it's not just fun. Thank you. We have a couple of questions that I believe I can funnel um, through this one particular one um, in the performance of spirituals mm -hmm. by musicians who are not Black. Um, this is from Charles, who writes, Good mm -hmm. afternoon, Dr. Thomas. Thank you for speaking with us today. I'm a high school choir director in Minnesota in a small rural community. In your opinion, is it possible for myself as a white person to program slash teach slash conduct this music with my students in a way that serves the music and its history in a respectful way? I do not wish to appropriate a culture or minimize the history of a community to which I do not belong. I understand that and there's a lot of concern and, and I'm glad that people are thinking about that. But I think we've become too, too, how can I say it? Too worried, too precious. I, I, I think you do the work on this music and you present this because all, all this music does is tells about life. It tells about loss. It tells about hardship. It tells about worship. It tells about, it tells, Biblical stories about characters. I mean, can't they identify with that? I would say yes. And the reason I would say yes so extensively is that there's hardly, you know, almost every major hall in the world, I think I've conducted at in some place. And, and I, you know, no matter where I am, and you ask about America's music, we want to sing something American. The first thing they say is, do you know any spirituals? Okay. That's the first thing that they say. And it is, it, it is America's music. And it is my ancestors' contribution to American music. And so, yes, you get to do it. It is not only exclusively for Black people, you know? But you have to understand the Black experience. Mm. Nobody ever asked me when I do a Hungarian folk song am I appropriating Hungarian culture, okay? We don't even think about that. Although we've made tremendous mistakes in that area. I'm, I'm you know, have people do the music of the Maori when parts of that music is, is more sacred and they've said it in a, you know, ding dong dilly way and, and choreographed it and, and everybody's jumped up and applauded to it, you know, simply because they didn't know didn't know. But your students deserve to know this. This is a part of their musical experience and their historical experience. And you can educate it and enlighten them. Thank you. Our next comes from Anne Marie, who <laughs> says, since so much of the spiritual tradition is oral, how authentic are written arrangements? Are there certain arrangements that are more truthful to the style and meaning of spiritual music as opposed to original composition that state they are in the style of a spiritual? Okay. Well, if they're in the style of the spiritual, they're in the style of the spiritual. If they're, if it's a, it says traditional spiritual, do know that there, and it's a concert arrangement, there's going to be something uh, in that text that is probably precedes or the entrance of the actual spiritual itself. As long as the spiritual text is and, and is, is, is in the forefront, I think we're okay there. Um, the, um, say that question one more time, I just lost my thought. No problem, no problem. Let me scroll back to it one moment. 
Okay. Oh, uh -huh. it was about the uh, whether or not the text is authentic. Okay, yeah. uh, you play gossip, right? And you tell the story to one person, and you tell the story, to, and it passes on down. And by the time it gets to the last person, it's in a different version than what the first person said. Yeah. And that's one of the you know uh, one of the things that was pointed out clearly in a book called Slave Songs in America, eighteen sixty five, uh, where they went and interviewed all these slaves. And um, you know, and listen to their versions because as one slave, you got to remember, not only religion, we had to break down the family unit. We're still recuperating from that breaking down of the family unit, selling off the father, um, you know, making the father say, "Hey, you are the breeder," you know, okay, sell off the children now. And so when people went from one plantation, now think about this, from the south, from Virginia on down to. Uh, North Carolina to South Carolina, then into Georgia, and then into Florida, and on over. Now, you can imagine slaves being interchanged and sold, and the versions of the songs they knew being taught. It is amazing to me that we have the melodies are fairly consistent all throughout in those very first transcriptions, um, which amazes me the versions of the text tend to get mixed up a lot, you know? And so what, um, what I advise arrangers to do is to go back to that early transcription and take the notation from that. Then they aren't arranging an arrangement. Thank you. Was that Anna Marie Friars? It, uh, no. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I believe our uh, our next question comes from an arrangement. Uh, apologies if I mispronounce your name, Nina or Nina. Um, Nina or Nina writes, I'm relieved to see that um, your list of arrangers is not restricted to simply black arrangers. What can I say to people who tell me my spiritual arrangements aren't valid because I'm white? Well, you know, right now we're in such a tumultuous period. Um, you can't really say, um, you know, what do you say to them? You know, you. I don't know. I think you get to write and express the music that uh, that you feel. Um, it's it's just you know, people say, oh my goodness. Um, there's no way that people should be singing gospel music. And there are some incredible gospel quartets and singers in Korea. They don't look like what you think gospel singers are, boy, but do they sound like it. That's because they spent the time. Now, I think you have to realize, you know, what is it about my style of writing and does my style of writing fit it? You know, Alice Parker said, you know, one thing she had to discover was she tried to make her arrangements too much like her theory lessons and composition lessons at Juilliard. And she had to go back to what is the source? The source is the melody. How is the melody? She says, I feel the ground of the earth when I start to write arrangements of spirituals. And I think if that's in your mind, you just write on and, you know, people will criticize one way or another. But I am not of the school that only black people can arrange, only black people can um, sing. No. Thank you. Apologies if I mispronounce this next name. Lucien asks about the role of rhythm in the spiritual mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps on to, to spiral off on that, I also remember in your text reading about um, Dr. Armstrong's different interpretation of, uh, of a specific <laughs> passage. <laughs> that was sooner will be done of Dawson's. Yes. Whoa. And so perhaps we can get into a bit of a discussion about rhythm, its role, and how it's interpreted um, in the spiritual. Well, you know, I think there's there is something about a sense of rhythm that I think we as you know we grew up hearing music 
we grew up hearing a beat and that beat is internalized in our body right and and that is all that is encouraged and has always been encouraged but i think it's just something we brought over from the motherland i you know there's just a sense of body involvement in singing you know um um and I, and I think that you have to understand what, that you have to be careful that you don't take things too fast, then you obscure the rhythm and it's not heard. If you take it too slow, you'll distort the rhythm and it's not heard. You gotta find where the groove lies in the piece of music. Okay? Um, with some of the arrangers, I think you got to think, okay, well, if Dawson really wants it at 56, I am, I'm of the opinion, I usually try to do it fairly close, okay? Number one is because I knew he'd get to me. Um, Anton decided something different, you know, because he had, he had listened very carefully, you know, when we were little, a movie came out called Imitation of Life. And uh, Mahalia Jackson sings at this funeral and she sings, soon I will be done. And she she sings, it, it's her, it's her, it, it's Mahalia Jackson's gospel singing. You hear it, the bubble. And, um, and as he felt in the text, he felt convicted to slow that down, to feel that feeling. And he's Anton Armstrong, so he gets to do that, okay? Um, and I would say as an arranger, sometimes I listen, uh, or I listen to my pieces and sometimes they're faster and slower than what I've indicated. And sometimes I even like it better. So I would say, you know, there's, there's more, there are many paths that will lead to heaven, okay? And nobody has the only path. Thank you. Nicholas asks, can a group of non-believers perform and arrange the spiritual authentically, or is faith a very important component in arranging spiritually? I think, well, you know, um, having taught at a state school for 34 years, uh, of course you have an assortment of people uh, <laughs> in your ensemble and and they draw different things from their experience of the music uh, for instance i had a student tell me you know she says every time we sing give me jesus i just cry it just reaches my heart he says and i don't know why i don't even believe in jesus and i said well something's reaching your heart you know and her her experience was 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 real uh, i remember being in israel with a choir 500 we had just finished and they came back and got me and said go back on stage i want you we need you to teach the entire audience the television was going three thousand people in the audience i thought i need to teach the entire audience what can i do and i went see the little baby and they went amen and i thought boy that works and then i got to the verses and i thought oh, i'm in jerusalem and do you know there was not one complaint so i would say that that even if the person is not a believer you know that person may find within that a, a sentiment um a feeling that moves them. Just like that young lady said, it moved her every time. You know, and bringing their own personal experience to it. You know, I think it's wrong to try to, to try to um, manufacture that. That has to be personal and it has to be, um, it really does have to be personal. Thank you. Our question from John. John writes, I love your comment about tone quality with Kathleen Baddeley and Tim Price, Jesse Norman. I want to know how we educate singers, colleagues, etc., that quote unquote trained is not the goal, but healthy singing for our kids. Oh, yeah. Well, you, you do that by modeling it. 
that, that's the only thing I can tell you. You have to model it and you have to reinforce it when you hear it. And you go, isn't that wonderful? Did you hear that? And the more you keep asking them that, they're going to keep listening for it until they can finally say, I hear it, I hear it. Yeah. Um, I, you know, sometimes you have to bend it a little bit in what you're doing. I, I did a piece called Past Life's Melodies. Uh, I brought it back. Uh, uh, well, you're shaking your head, so you, you might know it, but it's overtone singing, you know, to create the overtones above the head, you know. And, you know, when I first brought it in the first day, you got to remember, I brought this in when the piece was first written. And, you know, my university singers looked at me like, oh, what is this? <laughs> you want us to do what now? <laughs> and all of a sudden, they were like, what is that? And it, it hit. It hit. Okay? And I think sometimes you have to, you have to say, okay, they may not buy it at the beginning that, and you can't manufacture what manufacture how they will feel, but it's amazing to see how they feel. So I, I would say, yes, an unbeliever. I think it's a hard thing to integrate into any specific kind of worship for in certain circumstances. For instance, I was in, in, in Brazil and the choir directors came in by regions and I'd heard Bahia, Bahia, but I thought it was a greeting. And then all of a sudden, the, uh, the conductors came in from Bahia. And when they walked in, I went, oh, Bahia, because they look like me, you know? They were, uh, the African uh, culture is probably more intact in Bahia than even in some parts of Africa. Um, they were just, you know, and they said, Thomas, Thomas, tell, tell me this. Um, we do voodoo. <laughs> Can, can we sing these Jesus songs in voodoo? And I said, I don't think you want to sing those Jesus songs in voodoo. You might want to sing them. <laughs> you might want to sing them in some other place because they don't quite. Can we change the words to make them fit? And I said, I, probably not. But there's some other music that we can get you that will fit. Thank you. We'll do two more. One quick one. Uh, would you be able to share the two books again that you referenced, the, the names of those books that you referenced earlier in the PowerPoint? Okay, the, the first one was In Their Own Words, Slave Life and the Power of Spirituals, Eileen Gunther. The second was uh, Felissa Barber's and Boy, <laughs> I just forgot the title. I will. Um, I will follow. How about this? I will follow up with an email to everybody. Yes, with the title of that book. Great. Yeah. Uh, I'm so sorry to tell you that when you when we held the book up, it didn't show because of the background. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. No but you heard me speak about it. Yes, there we go. And then finally, um, if you are. If you have the opportunity to introduce a spiritual to someone for the first time, is there a specific spiritual that you would select and why? Probably this little light of mine. You know, I like it because it's so inclusive. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Yeah. You know, what do you say? It's what's inside of you that makes you you, you know, that gives you that special sparkle. Thank you. All right, everyone, that is a wrap. Please help me in thanking Dr. Thomas for being with us today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you so much for for inviting me and, and those of you that tuned in, thank you so much. I saw a couple of people I know from South Africa. And so it's good to see you too. Thank you, Raul. Thank you. If you enjoyed our content today, um, I hope you will consider a $10 donation to help keep our resources free and available. But more so if you are interested in um, and Dr. Thomas's research in the chat right now is a link to his text way over in Beulah land where you can purchase a copy and dive into your into your own reading uh, through his 
for his wonderful research. Thank you again to our sponsors, Dr. Gregory Gentry and the University of Colorado Boulder, Boulder. And of course, to you, our viewers, we're gonna see you in two weeks for our fourth lecture, Professor Valerie Harris, Training the Inexperienced Singer on July 14 at 2 p.m. Mountain Time. Please help celebrate these lecturers by sharing our content with your friends on Facebook and Instagram. We are at Choral Conductors Colloquium. Finally, I hope you'll use what you learned today to put beauty into our world. Thank you for watching. Dr. Thomas, thank you. Thank you so much. You are so welcome. And I just saw the South African uh, Zabelo wrote, we don't have TH in Africa <laughs> in our dialects. And he is so right. And we, we carried that through. Um, and I wish we had more time because we could talk about the difference between gospel and spiritual. Somebody else wanted to do that, but, but we're out of time now. Mm -hmm. Thank, you Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.